You are listening to the Daily Gold Podcast, covering precious metals, the junior mining sector, and global capital markets for intelligent investors. Now, here is your host, Jordan Roy Byrne. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Daily Gold Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, first time uh, we've done a podcast in a while, or a little while, I should say. hope everyone had a great new year. hope everyone is uh, doing all right so far here in January. A little bit of a tough uh, market for gold and gold bugs. Uh, here to talk about it is one of my favorites, one of your favorites. He is Vince Lancey. He writes the Gold Fix. You can find that on Substack. Vince is part of Echo Bay Futures. He's also an adjunct professor at UConn. So, uh, Professor Lancey, I know you just love that uh, title. Uh, yeah. I know there's a couple of things that we're going to talk about with respect to gold. Uh, first things first, I know you want to dive in to what happened um, at the very end of November. Right. I believe that that Sunday night or Monday morning, if you're overseas, when gold made its peak. We're going to we're gonna talk about that. Also, what happened uh at the beginning of this month, uh, because this is important because gold both times in position to really gain some momentum, breaking past important levels. But I mean, it was, it was really quashed at the end of November. So to tell us how this all got started, what happened then, you know, we saw gold trade above 2100 and then it just had this nasty reversal in less than 24 hours. Yeah, um, uh, I, mean, the, the, I mean, we talked about this beforehand, but you know, the tone for the last month since December seems like it was set in December third. Um, but you and I had talked several times uh, going into the November thirtieth close, and I kept peppering you, "What numbers matter? What numbers matter?" And you're like, "The monthly close, the quarterly close, the monthly close." And we were looking at all time high monthly closes in in uh, I don't know October and November, and you came up with a number. You said two thousand and nine. Spot 20, for a Nova, uh, closing above that for November, would be key. And you actually said you viewed it as more important than the December close. Now, you may have, you may not have said that, but I remember thinking about it that way. And you said because it's a, um, uh, it will be an all-time high monthly close. And the reason that the, the December close, as important as it is, because it's, 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 uh, you, you want it to close above certain levels, uh, the all-time annual close is already a done deal because gold was like $100 over the previous year's close. Okay, so here's what happened. Going into that, our last conversation you said to me, November 30th close is key. And we talked about why. And 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 from my observations, what we said or what you said would happen, happened. And that was this. If this market closes above 2009-20 on November 30th, um, you should expect that to attract more buying. And I said, yeah, that buying will be macro discretionary buying. That means not guys that chase, guys that buy dips, guys that chase, guys that do all kinds of things, but they just get long. And they're so much bigger than the normal run-of-the-mill hedge fund types. And so we got that close on November 30th, and I was watching this very closely because of that conversation. And talked to a couple people in China, China retail demand was off the charts. People are just, you know, buying physical everywhere. And that means the Chinese banks are going to be buyers in the futures market and the PBOC. So, so you had the November 30th close, which, which, which raises awareness. You had the Chinese demand that weekend, right? And <laughs> what's the other thing we discussed? The other thing was, um, oh, yeah, the other thing is there was, I, I, I heard there was a, uh, um, a sovereign wealth fund that was interested in buying gold after that, because a sovereign wealth fund frequently operates like a macro discretionary fund. And so I remember saying to my subscribers that Sunday, they always ask me what I think the market's going to do Sunday night. And I said, the market will gap higher. It could be like by a tick. I said, I wasn't trying to be bullish. The market will gap higher from all this demand this weekend. Let's see what happens after that. Well, the market gapped higher. Uh, December 3rd, Sunday night, traded sideways for about a minute and then screamed higher. And I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. I followed it live. Um, this is crazy. Uh, macro discretionary is going, you know, I can't believe they're letting this happen, you know. And uh, sure enough, it stopped and got squashed down in 30 minutes. 
And that moment, I believe, there was like a planetary alignment that overwhelmed uh, the market. And it just, you know, like putting two tons of shit in a, in a one ton bag, uh, the market exploded higher. And then, and then I think people that are interested in orderly markets, and I don't necessarily mean that in a conspiratorial way, people that want orderly markets that don't want problems like the Bank of International Settlements, <laughs> they were probably called in and said, hey, gold's too high, too fast. And they made it calm that night because gold's really not a big market <clears throat> for all the money that's out there. So what happened since then? Well, since then, you know, and this is what you've been all over, December 31st, December 30th, whatever that day is, the end of the year close is a non-event. And the market since then has been, uh, uh, people are scared to sell it short, but I feel like the impetus to buy it aggressively has gone away. And so I think that's where we are now. And we're, we're, we're continuing to see the after effect of that night manifest in a market that uh, in the past, oh, it's not going up, let's sell it short. Well, they're not selling it short this time, but they ain't buying it anymore either. So it's kind of like we're miserable with gold above 2000. So I don't know whether to be you know, happy or sad, but that's, that's how we got to this place that we're talking about. You know, that's, that's where we are. Hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. So, I mean, more recently, I mean, you're effectively answering, despite the fact at the end of December, I mean, we had a, a record yearly close, another record monthly close, you know, a, a, a great quarterly close. Yeah. I mean, despite it just, it produced no upside momentum. So the, the, buy, the, you know, no buying, but at the same time, those same people, they're not shorting. Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, come on. you got a market that's closing at all-time highs in November, and then it's got, what did you say? You said uh, quarterly, annually, monthly, all-time high closes, something yes. like that? Yes, yes. Right? Well, that's supposed to bring in buying. That's supposed to bring in, oh, I mean, if it was GME, if it was AMC, Christ, if it was the NASDAQ, it will be up 50 handles the next day. Where's gold? Unchanged. Uh, I, I think, and and not to mention, you know, to your point about end of the year and end of the month, there was no window dressing. Yeah, you know, there was no one saying, you know, I want to take it up. And and some also there was no profit taking. Usually at big numbers, you have volatility. There was no volatility. It's almost like they were told to not, I mean, they were told to not trade it. And so no new money came in in January. I agree, right? Now, maybe some of that money came in a little early in December, which is why we had part of that spike. But to tell me that nobody cares about gold, you know, after those closes in November and December, that's, you know, that's, you, you got to be brain damaged. And I just feel like there's there's a, a cap on this market. Uh, and I mean that, and I mean that not paranoid. Cap in the sense that, well, geez, we're at all-time highs now. I don't want to buy it here. The election's coming up. Let's see what the election brings. Meanwhile, at the same time, you still got China buying underneath. So nobody's got the guts to sell it anymore. And I'm talking to the bullion banks. They don't have the guts to sell this anymore like they used to. So, yeah, you're right. So what, I mean, mo moving forward, you know, for the rest of the year, at least the next couple of months, what are the factors that you're looking at? I mean, potential bullish factors versus potential oh. bearish factors. I know we, we've touched on many beforehand, but. Well, uh, I mean, there, there are several, but I think the one that, that's probably the most relevant right now, we can talk about the election and we can talk about this big picture stuff that I like to talk about. But I think the stuff that's uh, first in line has to be, has to be, uh, look, I've told you that there's Chinese buying. Yes, Chinese New Year is coming. Everyone knows about it. And that buying is literally in the market right underneath between 2000 and 2009. And there's probably buying underneath that as well as they scale in. But the market's not running away from it. So that makes me nervous. But the market's not filling it and going under. So that makes me comfortable. And now, putting those two things together, I look at gold and I say, gold sucks for trading, but it's doing well. And then 
new all-time highs in stocks, new all-time highs in stocks, new all-time highs in stocks. And I go, what the hell's going on? Well, everyone thinks the Fed's going to ease. Maybe they don't think it as much as they did a week ago, but everyone thinks the Fed's going to ease. And when that happens, stocks and gold rally. Gold's not rallying. So I'm a little concerned uh, that if the Fed doesn't ease or make a statement like that, then the bears will be comfortable selling gold below 2000 again. I mean, the, the stock gold relationship, which is something that you focus on very closely, um, come on, stocks can't be going up because of interest rates coming down unless gold's going with them. So that makes me kind of nervous about gold and stocks primarily. Yeah, well, I mean, on, on the technical side, we have the you know, gold against the S&P 500 ratio. That ratio has broken down. Um, at least as of last week, it was at a 17-month low. So that's that's favoring more upside in the stock market against gold. But interestingly, Vince, I mean, we talked about it beforehand. I was looking at something. If we look at the last nine years or so, what has happened in the last week or two with the stock market? That is now the fourth time that the stock market has reached a new high or broke into a new high after correcting, consolidating for, you know, whether it's two years, 18 months, 15 months, whatever. So this is the fourth time that has happened basically in the last 10 years. Now, two of the other three times when that happened, they were p important peaks in the gold market. The first was in the middle of 2016, you know, right when gold gold had that big move starting at the end of January 2016. Then it peaked around 1375 in the summer. Stock market then, it broke out from a consolidation correction since the beginning of 2015. Then you go back to COVID and basically right after, like days after the gold peak in August of 2020, the S&P broke above it's February 2020 pre-COVID high. So you have that. And the other point in time was in 2019, which was a little messier. But, you know, that proved to be really bullish for gold because the Fed was cutting rates. So that's and, – and, and so it's happened again. We're in the last week or so. The S&P has made a new all-time high for the first time in two years. And, uh, you know, that was just after gold – rallied back and kind of retested uh, the all-time high in weak fashion. So what does that tell you with respect to where we are here and now and what the you know outcome could be? Well, as, as that technical backdrop implies, right? What did you say? Two of the last three were a top in gold and one of the last three also coincided with a rate ease. Yes, that 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 is when gold in summer of 2019 uh, broke away. It broke above 1375. Right. So we want a repeat of 2019. We almost need the Fed to ease, based on what you're saying. You know, I mean, uh, geopolitical risk aside, it's not the same history. But in two of those three, that was a peak for gold. You're saying right, and in one of those three, it wasn't. But in the one that it wasn't, the Fed was starting to ease. So. It sounds like we should be hoping for an ease if we're bullish and uh, hoping for a non-ease if we're bearish, you know? And uh, uh, we have moved from, if you want to use the markets handicapping of the Fed's easing, and not my own opinion, uh, the market has moved from they're definitely easing in March to they're probably easing in March to they might ease in March. And that's happened in the last three weeks. And, and this is what's kind of freaking me out, Jordan. In the last three weeks, I've seen that, you know, the short-term interest rates, the stirs, you know, going to ease in March, definitely, maybe, hopefully, not sure, right? That's where we are right now. And during those four times, stocks kept going up and gold has stagnated. So, so uh, you know, this might be a tale of the stock market rising for different reasons, but uh, but I got to think that if the bond market goes up, stocks are going to go down. And so if the Fed does not ease, and they might not, it might be initially bearish for gold and stocks, and then bullish for gold later, but not right away. I think the, 
the first hurdle we got to get through is, is, is this Fed meeting in March. I think you're right. So when you mean the bond market going up, are you talking about bond yields or oh, oh. bond um, prices? How's this? How's this? If you want to look at the bonds and stock market as a, as a, as a function of the Fed easing, if the Fed's going to ease, bonds should rally, yields should come in, and stocks should rally, right? But right now, the Fed, although it seems like they're going to ease, possibly stocks are rallying, like they're definitely going to ease, and bonds are getting slammed. And bonds are getting slammed because of all the new supply coming out. And, and you know, it, it's like a tale of two drivers. If you're buying gold because you think the Fed's going to ease, then I personally think, although the statistics say I'm wrong, I think you're a moron. You know, I think you're buying stocks, you're buying gold because you want it to be a stock. It's not. Gold is here because of uncertainty. And that uncertainty came in the bond market getting crapped on because the banks like SVB were having problems because there's worries about the U.S. credit. That's a risk-off reason to own gold. The geopolitical uncertainty in Israel after Ukraine and the Middle East you know, we're probably going to have a, a Korean war and a Taiwan war or a combo war. Like all those reasons are reasons to own gold. But to 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 be a buyer of gold because you think interest rates are going to go lower. Well, you may as well just buy stocks, you know. So anyway, so, so I, I guess what I'm saying is, is right now to actually answer your question, stocks and bonds are diverging on their on their interpretation of what the Fed's going to do. So if the Fed's going to ease. Why are bonds not rallying? Why are yields continually creeping up? And if the Fed is not going to ease, then why are stocks rallying? They should come off. So if you look at the two of those markets together, even they're confused. So I don't feel so bad about gold right now, is what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, but what, I mean, think about the scenario where the Fed the Fed easing. I I feel like there's a, a risk that's growing that the Fed cutting rates is going to get pushed out. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I mean, it's going to get pushed out, you know, farther and farther to later and later in the year. I I, I think you're right. I think um, I think for whatever reason the market took his statement a couple of months ago was really dovish, and so everyone's like, he's going to cut in March. He's going to cut in March. Well, we're at all time highs. He's not going to cut in March. The right. markets are they're do, doing some easing for the Fed, you know, based on what they were saying. Right, right, exactly. So the 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 uh, the FCI, the Financial Conditions Index, which is a measure of how businesses are loaning money to each other, it's gotten easier. You know, it's gotten easier to get a loan if you're a business. You know, you're we're all starting to probably get credit card applications in the mail again. It's like, oh, you want a new credit card? It's like, why? You know, why? Because financial conditions are easing, and uh, and that's as you just said is the market doing the Fed's job for it. Um, and, and I tend to agree with that. I have one problem with it, but I need, I, need to, I need to think it through. And that problem is if the financial conditions are easing, which they are, you're right, why is the bond market not rallying with stocks? So maybe we should just be long bonds and long gold, meaning you know they both go up. Um, we should be long bonds and long gold as a hedge against bonds. Uh, or we should be short stocks and long bonds because they need to converge. I'm being a little bit trader wonky well, here. Maybe I it. could I could jump in on bonds, just a, a comment yeah, while yeah. you think that through. If you go back to, um, and I'm just talking about long term bonds. I use the ten year yield, and this I mean, you, and you also mentioned this in the long, you know, in the long run, you know, high interest rates went out basically, right. and that's true. History bears that out multiple times. But if you look at just the 10 year yield in the S and P over the last couple of years, the 27 or 28% decline in 22, the 10 year yield went from, I think it got up to, it went from like one and a half to 4% or something like that. Right. So the, sh the sharpest, like not the entire rise, but once the 10 year yield kind of got off the mat, cause you know, when it goes from 1% to 2%, that's kind of meaningless. When it right. goes from like two to four or five, I mean, that's really, scary because if you look at the mid 1960s it was when the 10-year yield went from four percent to five percent to then six percent. it was like oh shit when it went from four percent and it started going up 
Okay, so the ten-year yield going up, it you know, it, along with the Fed tightening, caused that decline in twenty-two. Then the market rebounded, but then when you had that decline last year, I think into the you know October low, you know ten or twelve percent, whatever it was, right. that bottom that bottom coincided with the ten-year rising to almost five percent, like it was a hair away from hitting five percent. So. I, I think that, and I don't want to, you know, simplify it and say, well, you know, if this does it, you know, because you have to be careful with correlations, but clearly the 10 year yield going up, um, it's not, that's not good for the, for the stock market, especially, right. especially if, you know, if, and when it gets close to 5%, because, you know, it's in the low fours right now, if it right. goes up to four, four or four five, I mean, that's not a big deal for the stock market. So I, I th- I think that basically we're I mean, what's happened in the last couple of, it's a complete change whereas now lo- if long term bond yields are going up that's putting pressure on the stock market right it, it is it is um <clears throat> um uh but you know to so, your I, point, so I guess right. last comment but sorry to interrupt again that's what, right. so so, but but it has to get to a certain level. So I, I think that the stock market can continue to perform until the 10 year, like when that starts getting, I would say above four or five, if it's going close to five, like that's when it, that's when you're going to see the correlation really set. I, in I think I'm going to, what I'm going to add, what I'm going to say now is going to completely add to what you're saying because I think it's it's true. It's not so much if you're looking at bonds as a, as a, as a mover of stocks right now, it's not so much that rates are going up that will hurt stocks right now, although it has in the past. Right now, it's rates going up to a point and breaking. It's almost like a trading range for rates now. If we get a new high in the long-term bond of rates, say five and a quarter percent, that could be the straw that breaks the camel's back. But until we get there, to your point, 4.4, 4.5, we're now in a new range for yields. So unless we make a new high in yields, I think people will take it as we've been here before, no big deal. So I think you're right. It's the rates that matter, but not necessarily the move in rates. It's the level that they have to break for people to start paying attention again. That's you know possibly true. Right. I mean, does that clarify your thinking with what you were saying before? No, it totally does. Yeah, it does. It does. It's like, I guess the cliche is rates don't matter until they matter, right? And it used to matter, you know, when they were moving off the lows. But now we've already weathered the first term, uh, the first storm of rates. And the reason we weathered it, as an as an aside, is the difference between now and those last times that happened is now we've got fiscal spending coming out the yin yang, you know, and and that money is going into the markets. So even with the Fed raising at five percent, and you see things breaking. You see certain industries not breaking, and those industries are getting the money that that's being given to them by the treasury. So rates matter, and uh, uh, but they matter at higher levels now because there is money being printed. It's just not being printed by the Fed right now, and so that's. I guess what I'm saying is, unless earnings, I mean, speaking a little bit of a fundamentalist right now. The stock market is going up despite the fact that the Fed may probably not ease in March, may probably push it back later. That means the stock market is going up right now because it's still discounting all that fiscal money that's being created and put into the markets, which means if earnings start to disappoint, then we have a bubble. So there's my answer. My answer to myself talking to you is if rates get above a certain level, stocks are going to crap out. Gold will crap out, and I'll buy it uh, with stocks, right? And if if um, earnings start to come in shitty, then that means we have more inflation than we say, and all this the stock market's a bubble. I'm just going to sell everything. That's that's my trading plan right now for what it may for, for what it's worth tactically, you know. And then we have the election, and we can all cry about that. Yeah, but but and then the other, I mean, regarding the Fed and rates, I think that, and again, you, we can't just look at everything in a vacuum but generally speaking i think until long term until long term yields hit that you know point where they start breaking shit then hot then higher rates are no fed easing that's better for for stocks 
relative to gold because we're the gold the gold to the s p five you know that ratio that we talked that chart yeah. which is broken down to new 52 week lows that's in the face of the fed of fed easing getting pushed back right, right. so so and it and it also may come back to you know, what i've been thinking for the last year or so that um you know the, the market could i mean potentially you want to sell the market when they start cutting rates basically because with the way things are going now the way it looks like i mean maybe a no landing economy i know that's you know not good for us gold bugs right. but uh, in that's like the feds you, you have the fed doesn't have to cut you know they can just jawbone and e ease by just jawboning periodically if the mar if the economy is going to be a no landing thing then that that scenario of no cuts that's better for stocks versus gold whereas if some you know the things you're talking about if if those actually force the fed to have to do something right that's you know that's more bullish for gold than the stock market i mean look i don't i can't believe people think the fed's going to cut you know what i mean like like banks were going under and they didn't cut so it sounds like the fed's really in control right now and to 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 the point that you're making um the fed not cutting is not as important to stocks as it used to be because because the fiscal side is stimulating the economy. Unfortunately, the fiscal side is not buying gold, right? If they were, then gold would be going up with stocks. So there you have it. I mean, uh, if the Fed doesn't ease, that, that's, that's a reason to sell gold and stocks. But stocks have all that extra money coming in from the fiscal side, and that's keeping them buoyed. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. I don't think the Fed's going to ease. I could be wrong. Uh, but uh, And... The other thing I'd say is, miraculously, despite all the fiscal, um, you know, you've had no downturn. I mean, other than the statistical recession in 22, you've had no downturn in any of the economic indicators. I mean, it, you had all this fiscal and 9% inflation, but somehow, some way, I mean, I know it's caused a lot of pain for a lot of people, but, you know, right. from the standpoint of looking at the capital markets, it hasn't you know the economic in employment income all that shit and they haven't rolled nothing's rolled over yet i mean we we yeah i mean half of the economy is doing great the other half's not doing great but the half of the economy that's doing great is carrying the other half so nothing is rolled over you're right i mean you know commercial real estate is going to zero i'm exaggerating but that's my point commercial real estate is going to zero well housing is going to infinity so on average, we're okay, you know. Uh, yeah, I know we got to run here in a couple minutes, Vince. But uh, any final final comments on anything? Um, just to sum, if you sum, you can sum up everything yeah. if you'd like. L lacking any convincing uh, forces on the market, I'm uh, sometimes I'm violently neutral. Right now, I'm just neutral, neutral, and I think the market. I would be happy. If this market remained above 2000 for two months uh, or maybe spiked below it and then recovered and went sideways, I would be happy with that. Uh, I'm not going to get crazy excited uh, or interested in the market unless the price tells me to be interested. So I'm not going to try and force an opinion on the market when the market just doesn't give a shit about my opinion right now. You know, and so 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 the, you got the Fed, right? You got the election ramp up. Right. And then and then I think, you know, I think the next thing is you have the next sell season. If nothing else is going on, come August, gold starts to sell off. That's it. So between now and August, I'm flexible. Between August and October, I'm biased bearish. And from October through February, I'm next next year, I'm biased bullish. So the election is going to be important this year, I think. All right. Thanks so much, Vince. As always, uh, we'll uh, have to talk about this again in the coming weeks or the coming months. Uh, can you can you give out uh, how people can follow sure, you sure. and subscribe to your Gold Fix? Yeah, the the Gold Fix uh, newsletter is something I started during COVID as a hobby, and it's actually become something that's quite legitimate now. We have a we have some very high level research and some commentary and conversations with people like yourself. As well as macroeconomic analysis. I'm going to give you a link. I gave you one before. I'll give it to you again. Uh, a link for anyone who comes through your site can get 30% off uh, for life 
uh, at the annual subscriber level. But um, I'd, I'd encourage everyone to try it out and uh, at the free level. And then you'll have the link. If they want to use it, they can use it. That's it. All righty. It's excellent. I'd encourage everyone to subscribe. Vince, thanks so much for coming on today. Really appreciate it. And I uh, hope we can do this again the next month or so. We will. Hopefully it'll be at 2,500, not at 1,500. Thank you for tuning into the Daily Gold Podcast. For more interviews, editorials, and analysis, log on to thedailygold.com. And for premium coverage of precious metals and the best junior mining companies, visit thedailygold.com forward slash premium. 